flag behind the astronauts is a prototype of the flag uh, which would be used on the surface. talk a little bit about forthcoming flight Apollo 11, hopefully the culmination of the Apollo national objective. And we are here uh, being able to talk about this attempt because of the success of four previous Apollo manned flights and a number of unmanned flights. Each of those flights contributed in a great way to, to uh, this flight. Every, each and every flight took a large number of new objectives and uh, large hurdles and left us with just a very few uh, additions, the final descent, lunar surface work, and ascent to be completed. We're very grateful to those large effort of uh, people uh, here at MSC and across the nation who made those first flights possible, successful, and made it possible for us to sit here today and discuss Apollo 11 with you. I'll ask Mike first to talk about uh, the differences you might uh, see in the command module activities on this flight. From the command module viewpoint, I hope there will be very little different on this flight than from its uh, predecessors. Dave Scott and John Young have run through approximately the same sequence of events which will take place uh, for me on Apollo 11, with the exception that the solo period will be somewhat extended on 11. I will uh, be in the thing by myself for slightly over one day, and that will include a sleep period. So in some uh, respects, that particular portion of the Apollo 11 flight plan more closely resembles, uh, for example, uh, Gordon Cooper's Mercury flight, where he was up by himself for 30-some hours. The uh, rendezvous is, has the capability of being somewhat different in that the Starting point uh, with the limb on the surface is uh, a far cry from uh, uh, the preceding rendezvous where the relative position of the limb and the command module were very uh, precisely known, having started out from the same little point in the sky together. Whereas in this case, uh, the command module obviously is whizzing around the moon while the, the limb is stationary on the surface, and this offers a uh, a possibility of rendezvous sequences which uh, could differ, could differ uh, significantly from normal. So I think those are probably the uh, two major areas in which this flight uh, uh, is somewhat different, again, strictly from the command module viewpoint. Another interesting point to note is, is that although I'm called the center seat man, in fact, I don't ride in the center seat. I ride in either the right-hand seat for launch or the left-hand seat for the Burns, entry, and the other major uh, flight plan events. But We do have a few new items on the LEM side of the house on this particular mission. We'll be picking up where the Apollo 10 flight left off when they did their phasing maneuver. And at this point, after 
departing the command module, coming down in the descent orbit. We'll be igniting the uh, descent engine for the first time under a long burn condition when it is not docked with the command module. And uh, executing this burn under control of the computer, being directed toward the various targets that are fed into the computer will be new on this flight. Also, we'll be making use of the landing radar and its inputs into the computer, inputs in terms of altitude and velocity updates, which will bring us down in the prescribed conditions as we approach the surface of the moon. Of course, the actual control of the touchdown itself will be uh, a rather new item in that it will be testing this uh, man-machine interface to a very uh, sophisticated degree. The touchdown itself uh, will test the, uh, be the ultimate test on the landing gear and the various systems that are in the spacecraft. The uh, environment of 16G will be seen for the first time by crews and spacecraft. We'll also be uh, exposed to thermal conditions that have not been experienced before. The uh, two-man EVA is something that is a first in, uh, in our program. Sleeping in the LEM on the lunar surface, which we hope to be able to do, will be another new item in this flight. Making star sightings with the alignment telescope to position the, uh, or correctly determine the attitude of the uh, inertial measurement unit and the land vehicle will again be done for the first time. This is a new technique that's used on the lunar surface. And then, of course, the powered uh, ascent with the uh, over seven minute burn on the uh, ascent engine. These things are the uh, new items that we'll be seeing on Apollo 11. They will bring us back up to that point in uh, the Apollo 10 flight where they had their insertion maneuver. From that point on, we hope that the rendezvous will uh, go as smoothly as it did on that flight. In preparing, of course, for all of these uh, conditions and uh, various contingencies that can develop, uh, we have faced a much wider variety of trajectory conditions that could result, as Mike has mentioned, and, and lead to uh, a wide variety of conditions of maneuvering spacecraft to bring them back together again. It's in these areas that uh, I've been talking about that Neil and I have been concentrating most of our efforts since these are the new items on our flight. The other portions of the flight plan have been pretty well uh, worked out by the previous flights. And of course, without uh, those procedures having been worked out as well as they have, of course, we would not be in a position to fly this mission. I guess that's all, Brian. We're ready for questions now. I have to ask you each to wait for the microphone and remind you that those who have those organizations with individual interviews after the press conference, please don't ask questions here. We have one here. particular gain do you see that you as human beings go there to the moon yourselves and for your country and for mankind as a whole and uh, do you think that eventually the moon will become uh, a part of the civilized world just as the Antarctic is now which was also once a remote and inaccessible place I uh, missed the first part of your question due to the inaccurate sound system, but I think I understand the gist of the question. And uh, first, let me repeat something that you've all heard before, but uh, probably uh, uh, 
addresses itself to your question, that is, the objective of this flight is precisely to take man to the moon, make a landing there, and return. That is the objective. Uh, there are a number of peripheral secondary objectives, including some of those you mentioned early in your question, that we hope very highly to, uh, to achieve in, in great depth. Uh, but the primary objective is, is the ability to uh, demonstrate that, that man, mankind, in fact, can do this kind of a job. Uh, how we'll use that uh, information in the centuries to come, uh, only history will tell. I hope that we're wise enough to use the information that we get on these early flights to the maximum advantage possible. And I would, I would uh, think that uh, in, uh, in the light of our experience over the past decade that we can, can indeed hope for that, that kind of a result. Jean-Pierre Chappelle, French TV News. What will be, according to you, the most dangerous phase of that uh, fly of Apollo 11? Uh, I think, was the question the most dangerous phase? Well, as in any flight, uh, the, the, the phases that give one most concern are always those which have not been done previously, things that are new. And uh, I would hope that in our initial statement, we gave you an idea, at least, of what the new things on this flight are. Now, there are other things uh, that we always concern ourselves about greatly, and that is those situations where we have no alternative method to do the job. We have only one. Uh, you, when you ride in an airliner across the Atlantic, depended on the wing of the airplane to stay on the fuselage. Without it, uh, you could not make the trip safe. There would be no recourse. Now, we have, on recent flights, have had some of those kinds of situations. Uh, in our lunar flights, the, the uh, rocket engine for the service module must operate for us to return from the moon. There are no alternatives. Similarly, in this flight, we have several situations like that. Uh, we have the ascent engine must operate to uh, accelerate us from the lunar surface into lunar orbit, and the uh, service module engine, of course, must operate again to return us to Earth. And as we go farther and farther into space flight, of course, there'll be more and more of these single point uh, systems that must operate. Uh, we have very high confidence level in those systems, incidentally, or uh, we would certainly uh, object to, to starting. One on the far side. Uh, Mr. Armstrong, I wonder if you and Colonel Aldrin could tell us how much walking you're going to do while you're on the moon, how far away from the land you plan to walk, and what sort of gait you think you'll be using. Uh, we, we, we were told the moon looks like pretty good ankle-breaking territory, and we wondered for instance, how you might avoid turning an ankle, falling down, or slipping, things of that nature. Well, uh, Buzz will be doing a good bit of the mobility studies early in our uh, lunar surface activity. I'll let him take a crack at that question. Well, first off, most of the planned activities that we have do not require us to move more than 50 to 70 feet away from the lunar module. Now, one of the uh, early activities that I'll be engaged in uh, after descending the ladder is, in addition to a, a rather preliminary uh, evaluation of just how well a, a man can handle himself in the, in the spacesuit on the surface, one of these things will, uh, will be called uh, uh, EVA evaluation. Now, as part of this, I'll be determining what is the best pace for moving, moving about, and uh, uh, there have been several different 
techniques uh, employed in the uh, partial zero gravity uh, trainer, the Poco machine, and it looks like you can uh, uh, walk conventionally one foot after another. It also looks as though you can uh, do a two-footed hop, kangaroo style. Now, we don't really think that uh, this will be the, the best means, but it does look as though this is possible. As the g-force uh, decreases, uh, I think we have a, a greater freedom to be able to, uh, to uh, come up with uh, body movements that are a little bit uh, different than uh, what we're used to in 1G. Now, I think uh, uh, one of the things that we have to be careful of is the uh, balance situation and moving about on the surface. Uh, we always have to be able to put a foot underneath where you happen to be, and of course, uh, the time period from when your foot leaves the surface till when it comes back down again is going to be longer uh, than it is in, in a pace, walking pace or a, a trotting pace sort of on, on the earth. And of course, this gives the uh, rotational disturbances more time to uh, have an effect. Uh, in doing some of the training in the uh, zero-g airplane, which has been flying at the 1.6g for this phase of it, uh, it looks as though at uh, a fairly rapid uh, pace, uh, I wouldn't, I'd hesitate to call it a run, uh, is quite easy to perform. And it looks like uh, uh, we shouldn't have too much difficulty in moving at something like uh, six, eight, ten miles an hour. But this is one of the uh, tasks that uh, we'll be attempting to evaluate very early in the EBA. Have one down here in the corner. Uh, for Neil Armstrong, uh, by the nature of your assignment, if you carry it out successfully, you're destined to become a historical personage of some consequence. And I'm wondering if in that light you have you've decided upon something suitably historical and memorable to say when you perform this symbolic act of uh, stepping down on the moon for the first time. No, I haven't. <laughs> I hope he doesn't say, oh, but I slipped. <laughs> it went back here. Uh, Mark Bloom, New York Daily News. I have a question for Neil Armstrong, if I may. Uh, being uh, the first man to step on the moon, the prospect is possibly that you'll be such a celebrated personality for the rest of your life that you'll never really have again what you might call a personal life. Uh, do you have any thoughts on this prospect? Well, I, I suppose if there's a, any recognizable disadvantage to being in the position I'm in, that, that's it. I think that's a, a fair trade. That one over here. Uh, I'd like to ask two questions. One, uh, the command module and the lunar module are going to be named or by uh, what you've been using in the simulation? Uh, I, I think you're referring to uh, the call signs of the spacecraft when they're separated so That's that we correct. don't uh, confuse yes. the spacecraft on radio transmissions. Yes, we, we do intend to use uh, call signs other than those that you may have observed in simulation. Uh, call sign of the, the lunar module will be Eagle. Call sign of the command module will be Columbia. Columbia. Now, those names, both names, were suggested by a number of people. Uh, very many large number other names, large number of other names were also submitted for our consideration, many of, of which were quite good. Uh, we, uh, we selected these two as being representative of the flight and the nation's hope. Uh, 
Columbia is the national, a national symbol. It's, Columbia stands on top of our capital. And uh, as you all know, uh, it was the name of Jules Verne's spacecraft that went to the moon 100 years ago. Let's catch some of these right in here. Name is uh, Tanberg. Uh, in case you find out you have to cut short your EVA, what will be the priority of the different tasks you plan to perform on the surface? And second, what kind of surface temperatures do you expect? I'll take a crack at the first one. Uh, our order of priorities was carefully integrated into the flight plan so that the most, most important things came early in the EVA and within operational limitations, the priorities reflect the order of things as they're done on the lunar surface, which means that should we have to cut that time short, the more, most important things would have been completed. Want to take track of temperatures, please? <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, uh, Rich Turnell, BBC. A question for Neil Armstrong. Um, it was reported by a former NASA official recently, who isn't sitting a hundred miles away from me, uh, that uh, you, Mr. Armstrong, exercised your commander's prerogative to step first on the moon instead of Buzz Aldrin. Could you please tell us what the facts are about this? And on a lighter note, could you tell us whether when you step on the moon you'll have had a shave? Uh, first, uh, I read one article to which you alluded, and it didn't state specifically that uh, the gentleman had said that I had done that. He said that I may have or could have or something to that effect. Facts are that my uh, recommendation was never asked nor given. Uh, the, we, we do hope to carry Razor aboard and uh, whether or not we use it is a matter of pilot option at the time and uh, if we feel so inclined, I, I would hope that that would be done. Torian of the Swedish Broadcasting. In the lighter way here, uh, you're now taking the trip of all trips of mankind. Can I ask each one of you, which place would you like to go to for a vacation when you come back to Earth? Well, I, I think that the situation being what it is now, the place I would most like to go immediately is the Lunar Receiving Laboratory. <laughs> if, if, I am, if I'm able to go there, we will have succeeded. I wondered if each of the three could tell us very briefly how your families have reacted to the fact that you're taking this historic mission. Well, who wants to take a crack? Well, I think uh, in my particular case, uh, my family has had five years now to uh, become accustomed to uh, this eventuality and over six months to uh, to face it quite closely and uh, I think they they look on this as a tremendous challenge for me they look up upon it also as a uh, an invasion somewhat of their privacy and a uh, removing of my presence away from the family for a considerable period of time. And, uh, I'm not sure exactly uh, whether this is the overriding feature uh, over and above uh, some of the uh, other more pleasant aspects of uh, uh, the particular job that I have as far as uh, it affects my family. Uh, Neil, uh, Marvin Miles, Los Angeles Times. I'd like to know, I understand, I understand that you're going to take manual control of the descent. Can you tell us at what point, how low you will take that control, how far you will burn down, 
and how low you could stage in the boards and go to apps if necessary. Um. We, we have made some significant improvements in, in the flight control system and the computer's interaction with that system in re recent months. Uh, allows us to go into somewhat hybrid methods of manual and automatic. Uh, the predicted method at this point, although we have a great deal of flexibility and choice based on the, on the situation at the time, would be to uh, maintain manual control of attitude and automatic control of throttle uh, through the final descent from an altitude of uh, somewhere between 500 and 1,000 feet until such time as the automatic throttling rate of descent was unsatisfactory, at which time we'll go full manual on the throttle. That is, rate of descent command on the throttle, which is operating through the computer, should that become unsatisfactory, then we can go to a full manual throttle, uh, flying it in a manner like a normal VTOL machine would be flown. So 500 feet is a good. That went down here. James Burke, BBC. You have mentioned that your flight, like all others, contains very many risks. What, in view of that, will your plans be in the extremely unlikely event that the lunar module does not come up off the lunar surface? Well, that's an unpleasant thing to think about. We've chosen not to think about that up to the present time. We, uh, we don't think that's at all a likely situation. It's certainly a possible one. But uh, at the present time, we're left without recourse at that account. Colonel Aldrin, uh, on Apollo 8, uh, you were the um, command module pilot in the backup crew, and this one, you're the lunar module pilot. How interchangeable in your preparation for this, or for that matter, in the flying of it, are the uh, roles of the crew? Well, at the uh, stage that we're at right now, I think they're not very interchangeable. <laughs> uh, Prior to uh, my assignment as backup uh, command module pilot on Apollo 8, uh, we worked together as uh, in slightly different roles, and it was, if I'm not mistaken, because uh, Mike was dropped out of the uh, mission that uh, we had an adjustment of the crews that, that put me from the lunar module pilot into the command module pilot's position. Uh, for Apollo 8, uh, there was no lunar module, so this was not much of an adjustment. Uh, it was just moving from uh, an emphasis on systems to more in, in navigation. Now, since I had previous training uh, to some degree in the lunar module, why then moving back into that position was, was not too difficult a task. Everyone on the far side. Uh, Mr. Armstrong, uh, er earlier there was some concern expressed that uh, you were rushed to get in all your training necessary for this flight. What is the, uh, uh, the state of your training readiness now? The, uh, the reason that that was a concern is that the, the final training for a crew is the last thing that takes place. In other words, the procedures must be developed and the simulations completely set up and the simulators ready to fly and the checklists made and so on before the final training can take place. And these, of course, were the pacing items, these intermediate things to the final training. At this point in time, uh, we have a high confidence level that the procedures and uh, checklists, simulations that we are now operating are correct and will 
fly the mission the way they are now detailed. So, uh, of, of course, there was a good deal of concern in our own minds and, and many other people in, in the organization that all these things for the descent, ascent, surface work would fall into place in time. We do uh, feel at this point that we've been very fortunate in, in having those things uh, make the schedule along with the, with the hardware, which of course is on the pad now and ready to fly. Yes, you were speaking of you were speaking a few minutes ago about naming the spacecraft Columbia and so on. Do you have any plans to name the site where you land? That is to say, the immediate area where you land. Will you give it any name or or not? Um, as on previous flights, we uh, in the absence of official names for various locations and landmarks on the lunar surface have have chosen to use some some unofficial names for our recognition purposes and for our training purposes. We'll continue to do that. One more over here. Well, Mr. Armstrong, there's been some discussion of the possibility that with uh, almost 10 hours interposed between the time of the landing and the scheduled uh, uh, moonwalk, that uh, crew may become a little bit impatient and uh, may start early. How do you now assess that situation? Well, in the, in the past, I guess, on our flights, we've dem demonstrated a somewhat more than average ability to change our mind and do things late or early or shift things around maintain as much flexibility as possible. And uh, I suppose that we would like to maintain that possibility now. Before the flight, we'd like to try to do just the opposite, get things set as firmly as possible in all our procedures and then attempt to stick with them. But should the circumstances at the time indicate that we can better achieve our objectives by by using the information that we're gaining at the time we're doing things, then we'd certainly like to reserve that possibility, and uh, I certainly wouldn't like to discount that, that this time. One right here. Jorge Ruiz Aguilar, Nucleo Radio Mil, Mexico.
an item of unusual interest in the in the nearby area that would warrant inspection uh, at the expense of of other of our planned tasks, we would certainly want to retain the freedom to make that inspection and uh, within our ability to get to the location necessary to do that, why we would certainly like to. I can't at this time say what such an object might be, but if it were an animal, I'm quite sure we would zip over there and take a look. Or maybe we'd go the other way. Joe Abelie, French TV News. This is a question for uh, Buzz Aldrin. How can you figure out the uh, chances of total success of moon landing and liftoff as far as the LAM and all systems in the LAM are concerned? I would figure the chances are quite high. To be more specific, uh, I wouldn't have the uh, first idea to go about really how to calculate these. I think the fact that uh, we've had uh, considerable success in our vehicles is indicative of what we hope will follow. Uh, we certainly have the utmost confidence of uh, total success. We have one in the front row here. One behind you. No, back, second row. Uh, I'd like to know uh, what kind of surface do you expect on the moon? Uh, for example, color, uh, the size of particles, or size of uh, boulders, and so on. I'd like to know uh, uh, Mr. Ald uh, Armstrong's opinion and uh, Mr. Aldrin's opinion, both. Well, fortunately, we don't think we have to guess. Uh, I suspect we may be surprised in some detail, but uh, uh, the color is, is uh, something uh, that is predicted to be uh, gray. Now, various crews in the past have called this bluish gray and brownish gray and greenish gray and uh, maybe slight shades of tans and so on, but we suspect that those, those colors uh, will manifest themselves in close, uh, close inspection. The size of the particles will probably be largely very small, sandy, fine, fine particles, but we do hope and expect to see some rock fragments. Uh, and I have no idea what size they might be, but we would anticipate that we'll have, uh, uh, be able to bring samples back up to and including the size of a golf ball. Or maybe larger rocks in the vicinity, but we wouldn't expect to bring back samples, large samples. I think both the uh, answers to your questions have pretty well been borne out by the uh, surveyor program, uh, indicating a very fine grain uh, cohesive material uh, with an abundance of varying sizes and varying shapes of uh, a harder uh, rock. How will you be able to follow the activities uh, during EVA? Will, it, will you have a visual monitor? And secondly, another question, could the EVA period be extended if everything goes real well? Well, I have two different ways of listening to uh, Neil and Buzz while they are in the LEM and also while they're out on the lunar surface. Uh, first, uh, I have direct radio contact with them uh, on very high frequency radio during a 13 minute period that I'm uh, uh, in view of them. I can uh, talk to them when I can see them during this 13 minute period that the command module goes overhead. In addition to that, the ground relays on the S band, our normal air to ground frequency, they relay to the LEM everything which I say to the ground and vice versa. All LEM communications uh, go to Houston where they're turned around immediately and sent back up to me so that uh, they hear everything I say uh, within five seconds of the time I say it and, and the reverse is also true. Now the S-band is 
is uh, operable any time I am within line of sight of the earth, not necessarily the, the limb, you see, so that uh, out of each two-hour revolution, uh, oh, roughly 60% of the time I am in contact with the ground and therefore I am in contact with the limb. In regard to seeing them, uh, I'm afraid my eyesight's not quite that good. They're, they're too small uh, to be seen from an altitude of 60 miles. There is a, a possibility, and we intend to explore it further, that uh, the limb itself will be visible from the command module. The, uh, the flat sides of the limb uh, being made of a mylar substance which reflects sunlight gives us hope that, we, uh, that I'll be able to see a flash of light uh, at precisely the proper sun angles when I am nearly overhead. And this, uh, of course, remains to be seen. I have a question for Mike Collins. Uh, what will the uh, command module pilot be doing while the commander and the limb pilot are on the lunar surface? Will you be doing any special experiments of any type or not while you're up there by yourself? This is while they're on the lunar surface. I, I heard the first part. What will I be doing? And specifically uh, the second part? Are there any specific type of uh, planned experiments that are new that uh, you'll be performing while uh, Neil and Buzz are on the lunar surface? No, there are no... Uh, there are no uh, experiments as such. Uh, as I said earlier, I hope to uh, to determine uh, whether I can uh, see the limb from 60 miles up. And in addition, I hope to get some detailed uh, uh, navigational sightings on the the location of the landed limb. I will take some uh, optical marks on the limb if I can see it, and then this. Uh, uh, these marks will be fed into uh, the arithmetic of the computer, which will then be able to determine uh, more precisely the exact uh, latitude, longitude, and altitude of the uh, of the limb on the surface. But uh, th these uh, uh, really are not experiments as such. They're just part of the overall uh, framework of, uh, of trying to piece together exactly where the limb is relative to the command module for the ensuing rendezvous. Other than that, I'll be doing housekeeping, sure of which there are many. Shima, West German TV Channel 2. Uh, could uh, Mr. Armstrong perhaps tell us, is there any legal importance in getting down on the moon? I mean, if you are settled down there, would any area there be the property of the United States or a wider area, or is there absolutely no legal implication? Well, I think we might refer to this uh, plaque again in the last line says, we came in peace for all mankind. I think that's precisely what we mean. Orion, Swedish television. Neil Armstrong said before that it was rather unpleasant to think of the fact that, or the possibility that you would get stuck on the moon. What is the longest time uh, if the ascent stage doesn't fire? And I think uh, Mike Collins said in an earlier interview that he would have, then have to, to just leave and go back to the Earth. What is the longest time you can wait between the not firing and the time when, the, when Mike Collins would have to go back, the time you would have to work on the moon and to fix whatever was wrong or try to fix it? Give those numbers immediately at hand. I, I, I don't have the, the numbers. Uh, Probably uh, would be a matter of a couple of days. At what point in the timeline will the American flag be erected on the moon's surface? What? It's uh, going to take place uh, when we are both early in the time period when we're both on the surface uh, in order to aid each other with the uh, unstowing and, and uh, operation and it also should be uh, at the time period when we have uh, the TV camera placed in such a position that it would be able to see that uh, should uh, I don't mean to sound discouraging but uh, I don't have high hopes that the picture that uh, we'll be able to send you back from the, the surface will be nearly so good as those you've been looking at from in the recent flights from the command module. 
are uh, the camera is somewhat different and uh, we're somewhat more uh, restricted in the kinds of lenses and the kinds of that we can use and the kinds of lighting we have available to us and the resolution of the camera and I suspect that you'll be somewhat disappointed with those pictures. I hope that you'll uh, recognize that uh, uh, that is just uh, one of the problems uh, that you face in a, an environment like the, the lunar surface and it'll be some time before you really get high quality lunar surface pictures back on TV like. James Pearl of BBC. Colonel Collins, uh, to, the, to people who are not astronauts, you would appear to have the most frustrating job on the mission, not going all the way. How do you feel about that? Well, I don't, uh, I don't feel in the slightest bit frustrated. I'm going 99.9 .9 some percent of the way there, and that suits me just fine. Uh, I couldn't be happier to be right where I am. I'd like to say in that regard that uh, the, the man in the command module, of course, by himself, has a a giant sized job to do. Uh, he has to run Rosa's job and my job along with his own job simultaneously and uh, in addition uh, act as uh, relay to the ground and be available for any kind of questions that we have to ask him and any that the ground and it's really about a, a, at least a three man job and of uh, the utmost confidence that uh, Michael certainly not lack for something to do while he's uh, circling around, and if, uh, if he can't think of anything else, he can always look out the window and admire the view. We're coming up on the hour. We've got time for one more question over there on the far side. Yeah. In from your previous experience in the two and a half hours or so that you're atop the rocket before actual blast off, is this a period of maximum tension, rather like uh, being in a dentist's waiting room? I didn't quite get, would you repeat that question, sir? Is the period uh, when you're actually on top of the rocket just before blast off, is this wait a period of maximum tension? Um, speaking from past experience, I haven't found that to be the case in the Gemini series. Uh, you're usually quite busy in that, that time period, and it's one uh, uh, one of the phases of the mission is we have a very high confidence level in. We, it's nothing new. It's things that have been done before and done very well on a number of occasions, and uh, we're quite sure that that, uh, that booster will go. We, we promised the still photographers a chance to get some pictures at the end of the press conference. We'd, we'd like to do that right now.